Well, great. It looks like our numbers are not rising as much anymore. We've still got people coming in, um, but I will just say welcome. My name is Bailey Gordon. I am the interim executive director for the for the Oklahoma Business Ethics Consortium. So thank you all for being here. Um, I believe most of you are members today. Thank you so much for your membership and for being part of um, for being part of this organization. You know, we know that, especially as we have all gone through so many things this year that we haven't navigated before, this is definitely a time when um, a commitment to ethics and ethics education is so important as we're all trying to move forward in the best possible way. So I wanna thank our speakers today for joining us as well. Dr. John Schumann, from the, who's the president of OU Tulsa, and Brianne Kinnemer, who's with us from the Greater Oklahoma City Chamber. So we've got Tulsa and Oklahoma City both well represented today. Um, I know we do with our attendees as well. But thank you all again for being with us and we look forward to hearing from you in just a minute. So I will um, go ahead, I believe we can, it looks like it's time to go ahead and um, get started with our guiding principle for the day. So Brianne Kinnemer is here to present for us. Like I said, she's with the Greater Oklahoma City Chamber and is the membership manager there. So a lot of you have pro pro who are from Oklahoma City have probably worked with her before and um, she's a familiar face. So she serves on the boards of several nonprofits in Oklahoma City and she and her husband Cole welcomed their first child Theo last August and he is very cute. So um, I am going going to go ahead and turn it over to Brianne. Thank you, Bailey. I agree with you about Theo, but I might be biased. Good morning. I'm going to share with you all a few recent examples of local businesses who have been putting into practice the guiding principle of collaboration. I think you'll be proud of our community, and I hope you'll be inspired to similarly find ways to collaborate for the benefit of others. So one of the stories I'm going to share will highlight this video that Bailey's got going for us, and I'm going to leave it playing to showcase collaboration in action, and I'll tell you more on it in a minute. At the Chamber of Commerce, we're often a hub that people come to when there are miscellaneous needs within the business community. In late December, we started hearing from some of our member businesses that there was a real serious need within the healthcare community. The public health experts told us that the number of positive COVID cases was set to peak in coming weeks, which would be followed by a peak in hospitalizations, and then eventually a peak in deaths expected in late January. Knowing that hospitals were at max capacity and that healthcare workers were stretched thin and exhausted, we asked leaders from our four main hospital systems in Oklahoma City, Mercy, SSM, Integris, and OU Health, we asked them all to hop on a quickly organized phone call the week of Christmas. They made time for us to collaborate and they stressed in that phone call that there was a dire need of support for their frontline workers who they said were struggling. At the beginning of the pandemic, they were seeing parking lots full of cars honking and people flashing their lights. You all remember that, people waving signs of support. And that had all since faded as pandemic fatigue set in for us all. Healthcare workers were now facing the most difficult few weeks of the pandemic coming up and they needed moral support to be certain, but they also had some material needs too. So we set out to see how we could help with both. On the material need front, we heard that workers who were stretched to capacity were having difficulty finding time to do simple things like getting their groceries or picking up their dry cleaning. Another need we heard was for indigent patients who were being discharged but they needed basics as simple as socks in order to ensure that they could stay healthy upon their release. So we put our heads together and we reached out to a few of our chamber members to see if they could help. We called Homeland to see about getting groceries for those workers who needed them. Their corporate office came up with the idea to enlist Instacart to provide grocery delivery to the healthcare workers at work at the hospital and with no delivery fees. We called Scott Cleaners who orchestrated a way to pick up laundry from frontline workers at the hospital and bring it back the next day. We called Feed the Children, who happened to have an entire pallet of name brand socks, those Bombas socks I bet you've all heard about, and they were happy to donate those to patients in need of the basics. People were collaborating and needs were being met. We also understood that they had asked for that shared need that they all had 
for a morale boost for their workers as those hospitalization numbers were rising and climbing to a peak that we knew was coming. So we turned to others to collaborate. We asked Mayor Holt to send out a tweet calling for submissions of appreciation videos and people responded as you see playing here. We received videos from the Oklahoma City Dodgers, from News 9, from Remington Park, from the Science Museum of Oklahoma, Goodwill, a lot of small business owners that you see. Even my six month old Theo made an appearance. So the Communities Foundation made the cute intro logo that says we love our OKC COVID heroes. The Oklahoma City Ad Club took all those videos that were submitted and they created one seamless video and RK1 production did all the graphics. Then the chamber went back to our friends at the local hospitals and we asked them to share the videos with their frontline workers. It went out in emails to all the employees from the CEOs of the hospitals and they aired it in areas where employees would see it throughout the hospital. I'll sum up the response that we heard back from them with this quote that I got from Jim Gebhardt, the president of Mercy Hospital. He said, this is amazing and I can't tell you how well this will be received by the healthcare workers in our community. It really shows how close of a community we really are and I can't tell you how much it's appreciated. Through each of these examples of collaboration, our community successfully executed two of the descriptions found in the consortium's guiding principle of collaboration. So first of all, the achievement of common goals through the promotion of ethical, mutually beneficial relationships. And second, the cooperation emphasized over competition. Under extreme duress, these competitive healthcare entities put competition aside and they instead collaborated to take care of their mutual need. Each of the organizations and individuals who stepped up to help secure those material items or to make a video to boost morale did it not because there was any financial benefit in it for them, because there wasn't. They did it because it was the right thing to do. And when we do the right thing and we do it in service to others, we all benefit. I hope these stories make you proud of our community, but more importantly, I hope they inspire you to collaborate with others for the good of us all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brianne. I am really enjoying flipping through. I saw, um, I saw one of our own OK Ethics board members, uh, Jim Priest here in the video. So it's great to see so many familiar faces, like you said, coming together for good. So we do applaud all of our um, all of our healthcare workers who are still working tirelessly to get us through this. And so that um, is a great way, um, a great segue into today's um, today's program of how medical ethics can inform business ethics. So we're really looking forward to learning from you, Dr. Schumann. So I will go ahead and read his bio so that we can get a great introduction to Dr. Schumann, and then I will turn it over. So John Schumann, MD, became president of OU Tulsa in 2015. He previously served as associate professor, residency program director, and vice chair of education for the Department of Internal Medicine. He also holds the Gusman Endowed Chair in Internal Medicine at OU's School of Community Medicine. Dr. Schumann earned a Bachelor of Arts in History from Yale University, and following graduation, he worked for the United States Information Agency in Washington, D.C. After shifting his focus to medicine, he earned his MD from Case Western University, uh, Case, Case Western Reserve University, excuse me, in his hometown of Cleveland, Ohio, and completed his residency at Cambridge Hospital in Massachusetts, where he served as chief resident in internal medicine. After a year as a faculty position with the Cambridge Health Alliance, he moved with his family to the south side of Chicago, where he joined the faculty at the University of Chicago in 2002. So, Dr. Schumann, you may be a little more familiar with all this snowy weather that we're having after your time in Chicago. Um, Dr. Schumann then led then completed a fellowship in clinical medical ethics at the University of Chicago's McLean Center, after which he became a faculty affiliate. He also co-chaired the faculty advisory board of the university's human rights program for which he developed and taught a multidisciplinary course called entitled Health and Human Rights. His scholarly work includes research and advocacy on the ethics of profit-driven commercial screening tests and analysis of patients that leave hospitals against medical advice. 
Dr. Schumann has authored the blog Glass Hospital since 2010, writing monthly posts aimed at demystifying medicine and bringing transparency to healthcare and policy for lay audiences. His essays are frequently picked up by leading national health and patient advocacy blogs. He has also written for national publications such as The Atlantic, Slate, Reader's Digest, and NPR's health blog, Shots. He is also the developer, co-producer, and host of the Studio Tulsa program, Medical Mondays, on Tulsa's local NPR station, KWGS 89.5 FM. His weekly show explores healthcare and the human condition. He has also contributed to the National NPR Radio Program's Marketplace and All Things Considered. Dr. Schumann serves on the board of directors for a variety of community organizations, including the Tulsa Regional Chamber, Tulsa Area United Way, Oklahoma Policy Institute, OCCJ, Sustainable Tulsa, Congregation B'nai, oh, I'm sorry, Emuna, did I say that correctly? B'nai Emuna, yeah. Emuna, there you go, B'nai Emuna. The 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre Centennial Commission, Tulsa Literacy Coalition, Tulsa Cares, and Impact Tulsa. So you have a very busy schedule from what it sounds like. Um, Dr. Schumann is married to Dr. Sarah Ann Henning Schumann, a family doctor and board member of the Tulsa Health Department. And together they have a daughter, Noah, and a son, Jesse. So Dr. Schumann, thank you so much for spending your time today and for sharing your experience and expertise with us. So I'm gonna turn it over to you. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you so much, Bailey. Can, uh, I hope people can hear me okay. Never are too sure when you're talking into the, uh, into the laptop as I am here. But thank you so much for the warm introduction. And it's great to be um, with the Oklahoma Business Ethics Consortium today. And what I hope to do uh, is just um, share my screen here. Um, and uh, let's see, take you through a... Um, a quick overview of medical ethics. And this is something uh, I've taught to medical students and to medical residents for, well, more than 15 years, I guess. And I've done it every year. But um, as you may have gathered from the introduction, I one of my passions is communicating kind of medical concepts to lay audiences, to non-medical people. Because medicine and healthcare is something that impacts all of us. Um, you know, whether we like it or not. And um, there's lots of incredible good that comes with it, but there's, some, frankly, there's some harm that comes with it too. And that's one of the things medical ethics takes um, a deep a deep look at. But I was particularly intrigued and, and, and very grateful to be invited to speak to you today because um, I think that, you know, medical ethics is a uh, an academic topic all into its own, but it has practical, clinical, relevant daily implications in how we progress in healthcare. But then business ethics is something uh, that's kind of in the background in medical ethics and in healthcare, but it's not something that I think of on a daily basis. And yet the opportunity to kind of think of the Venn diagram of how medical ethics and business ethics overlap, uh, I think there's probably more overlap than we think. So um, today's learning objectives, you probably saw in the flyer but I'm going to just demonstrate the very foundational principles of medical ethics. And even though they sound very technical and technocratic, you know exactly what they are. Uh, when I when I share them with you, you'll say, "Oh, that makes sense," or you know, "I, I knew this kind of intuitively." Um, and then how they can how they can influence business. And then I'm going to talk about my own industry, healthcare and medicine, in ways in which I think it strays from sound business ethics. And you in, in, in our audience today may have experienced this firsthand, either as a patient yourself or with a family member. Um, there are ways that I think the healthcare industry could, could vastly improve um, in its business practices and business ethics. You know, many people talk about our national healthcare system in the United States as the lack of a system. We have a non-system of healthcare. It's so piecemeal. And since you're, you're all business folks, you're either employees or employers so you're typically covered with uh, health insurance through your workplace, and that represents the largest share of, of how people are covered in the United States. But then the, the other biggest ones, of course, are Medicare, the large government program for people 65 and older, Medicaid, and then, of course, there are veterans benefits. And then there are people that are either self-employed or don't have insurance. And so that's something that's very complicated and maybe unnecessarily so. And then um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about COVID-19 because... Well, why not? We just heard about that um, 
in the in the uh, introduction, and uh, I am a doctor, and you can ask questions about that. I have uh, I I'm not really on the front lines. I do still see patients one day a week, um, and I have seen patients who have been um, at risk for COVID and who have had COVID or have you know are have had COVID in the past. I've also been lucky enough to receive the COVID vaccine because I'm still seeing patients. I've received two uh, the two doses of the Moderna vaccine, so I'm happy to answer questions about that. But um, the COVID-19 is a, uh, the pandemic is a fantastic example of medical ethics kind of in action. And, uh, you know, that's, we could spend the whole, the whole time just talking about that. But right here on this slide are the principles of medical ethics. There are four, just these four. And again, they sound kind of academic and wonky, but I'm going to explain what they all are. So they're autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence, and justice. And that's it. You, you could now pass a multiple choice test on the principles of medical ethics. And I'm going to um, kind of go over each one. So autonomy is the idea that you have discretion over your own body and your own medical decisions. And that's that simple. But there was a time prior to World War II in the history of medicine where the doctor knew best and where what the doctor said was, it was like a law. And if the doctor said to do this, you did it. Well, you know, we've, we've come into a whole idea about patients' rights and patients' ability uh, to refuse to, to undergo medical treatment. And fundamentally, courts have upheld that idea. So there's a legal and an ethical basis for understanding that patients have the right to their own autonomy. That is, they can make their own medical decisions. And so one of the things we have to do as medical professionals, and this cuts across all specialties, is assess somebody's medical decision-making capacity. That is their capacity to make sound medical decisions. And if we determine that someone has capacity to make decisions, they can make what we think of as an unsound medical decision. That is to forego or not undergo treatment, even when we think it might be beneficial, but that is somebody's right. So this is my way of getting some audience participation to ask you what kind of persons, what groups, or what people lack medical autonomy or, or lack the ability to make decisions for themselves? Are there any that you can think of? I may have to, let's see. Yeah, oh, wow, boy. <laughs> Bailey was right. So exactly right. I see answers bursting through. So many people have said kids. Um, actually, there's an interesting one in here. Somebody says prisoners. So people who are incarcerated actually do have the ability, they still have autonomy to make their own medical decisions. Um, and interestingly, people who are incarcerated, the, the prison population are one of the few groups in the United States who actually have a constitutional right to health care, which is something very few people know. Minors, kids, same idea. Somebody mentioned Alzheimer's patients, and that's exactly right. So when you think of adults, so usually adults have um, the ability to make medical decisions, but when, they, when you develop an illness that can affect your cognition, and when we think of Alzheimer's, we particularly think of memory, but it also affects language capability. So that's, that can be your ability to express an idea. You have to be able to understand a medical decision you have to be able to operationalize it and have to be able to then exercise a choice. And if you can't do that, you don't really have medical decision-making capacity. So the audience is really paying attention and really knows this stuff. So that's exactly right. Those are the folks. Now the question then becomes, well, who decides? So for children, usually it's gonna be their parents. Well, if they don't have parents, it'll be their guardian. And similarly for older folks who may suffer from cognitive impairment, be it Alzheimer's dementia or different other kinds of dementia um, or brain, brain issues, um, Certainly, you know, strokes that can be another cause, what so-called vascular dementia, um, caused by multiple strokes. You know, we usually turn to their kin, their their adult children or other family members. Their spouse would be the the usual place to go. But sometimes we have what are called medically unbefriended people. It's a fancy way of saying we have people who show up in the hospital who have no family that we can find, and so sometimes we turn to the court to find a guardian ad litem, a guardian of the court to help make decisions for those folks as well. So that's excellent. So that's autonomy. The next one is uh, not advancing. Let's see, why is it not advancing? Uh, maybe I have to get back in, there we go. Okay, beneficence. This is just the fancy way of saying that we try to help people, right? And that's a fundamental sort of bedrock concept of healthcare. We're trying to help people. We're trying to 
cure them in the utmost ideal sense. We're trying to comfort them um, and we're trying to um, essentially diagnose and treat them from whatever condition that they may have. And so this is the, the sort of do good and I'll contrast that with non-maleficence, which is the, the idea that you've heard in the Hippocratic Oath, first do no harm, primum non nocere. So in beneficence, um, think of an example if you can, when do the benefits outweigh the harms? And this is something we think of in a sort of on a daily basis, right? If you have a cold or you have influenza, or let's say you have a, you know, an infection, you know, are you going to take antibiotics? Well, you know, usually there are some harms with taking antibiotics. One is they can cause other systemic side effects. They can cause you to get diarrhea uh, because they wipe out the good bacteria that live in your colon. Um, but usually the benefits, if you're treating a primary bacterial infection, that's going to, that's going to outweigh the harm. Um, the, um, let's talk about non-maleficence and I have a, a poll question here. So what are, let's flip it. We, we try to do good, but, and we don't want to do harm. What's an example of when a medical intervention might cause harm? Maybe more harm than good. Emo, yeah, surgery, good. Assisted suicide, these are great answers. So th th this audience is fantastic, engaged. Allergies, right, allergies to medication, right? So we, we might prescribe a medication to uh, treat a condition or to, or to mitigate a symptom, and the treatment may wind up doing more harm than good. Um, certain surgeries, elective surgeries, right, they may do more harm than good. So people, um, it, it, I'll, I'll give you an example, a personal example. My father, he's a, he grew up, uh, he was born in 1938, pre-World War II, and he grew up in the 1950s, and he just, he believes so much in medical progress, he, and he sort of thinks anything that a doctor offers is good. And so he, he winds up getting offered all these treatments. And so he'll call me as his doctor son and say, well, should I do this? Or should I have this test? Or should I have this treatment? And I always say, well, you know, are you suffering from this symptom? No, I feel fine. Well, <laughs> why would you undergo a surgery if you feel fine? He sort of thinks he's in the mindset that having surgery just automatically makes you better, makes you as good as new. And I explain that there's always a cost to doing surgery. Not that I I've highly respect surgeons and all of the training that they've had and what they can do to, to help people. But, um, you know, we tend to think about this with our athletes, say like the Oklahoma City Thunder, when someone, uh, an, an athlete gets a knee injury and winds up going under the knife for having a, an arthroscopic knee surgery or an ACL reconstruction, these things are not without cost and they take months and months of rehabilitation in order to try to get back to the pre-surgical level or pre-injury level. Um, somebody also mentioned, you know, treatments when the quality of life is very poor. And that's a, that's a really um, interesting example because we have uh, a very aggressive medical system that has, uh, that has evolved to take care of people at the extremes of life, the very young newborn, as well as the very elderly person who may have lots of comorbidities or co uh, multiple illnesses at once. And it turns out that um, there's sort of a law of diminishing returns. And that is we, can, we have a, an amazing ability with our technology to keep people alive, but sometimes the, the patient, him or herself, who may not be in a, in a position because they're so gravely ill, might not be able to exercise a medical choice or a medical decision, they may not be able to, to voice that choice. And so we turn to their family and say, well, what would, your, what would your spouse or what would your parent or what would your loved one want in that situation? And so it, it becomes, it makes many of us uncomfortable to think, well, who am I to judge the quality of life of my parents? And, you know, life is, is, uh, is a fundamental goal and we wanna prolong life at all costs. But many of us who've had family members or friends go through the healthcare system or be near the end of a natural life, whether it's in their 80s, late 80s, 90s, even in their hundreds, we start to say, wow, well, maybe they wouldn't wanna go through all this or looking at the medical treatment as prolonged suffering. And that's where medical ethics can really be beneficial. And so hospitals have medical ethics committees these are never easy, never easy discussions to have and never e easy situations to resolve. But medical ethics provides this framework to discuss what are the goals of care and what are ways in which we can honor the wishes primarily of the patient uh, if they've been written down or documented or previously expressed. So that's one way in which um, the practic practical aspects of medical ethics come to the fore, which is we talk about something called an, ad an advanced directive. And most states have advanced directive laws. Oklahoma is no different. And you can actually download for free. You don't need a lawyer. 
to have an advanced directive and you can decide. And here's the thing, people get very understandably worried about signing an advanced directive because it seems so immutable. Like you make a choice not to be on a ventilator, for example, because you've seen someone else be on it and you think I would never want that for myself. The good news is you can always change your mind. Um, but um, you, it's, it's a good thing to think about. And so we have established this sort of tradition amongst family members of using Thanksgiving time as a time to have family discussions with, with elderly parents. And I would encourage any of you in the audience today, um, whether, you know, to think about your own wishes, to talk about it with a spouse or a loved one, or talk about it with, with your parents if they're, if they're still alive. Um, and there's a, a really good question in the chat, but I'm gonna leave it for questions, uh, but I'll just say it here to, to provoke your thoughts. Heard it, I've heard it said that we're not living longer, we're dying longer, uh, thoughts. I would just say that that's, a, that's a, an interesting um, uh, thought, and, and uh, I would welcome an opportunity to discuss that in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the Q and A. Um, the last one is justice. And so I'll just do one more audience poll and I'll ask you, using your, your sense of business ethics, what examples can you think of, of applying the principle of justice in healthcare? And this one's a little, sometimes this can get into the politics and we don't talk about politics here and I'm, I'm not at all interested in, in your political opinions. Um, I mean, I am, but I'm not, I'm not here to talk about that. But um, wh what are some ways in which we think about justice as it applies to healthcare? And I'll, let's see what you, what you come up with. Um, so I, I might have to give you a little more help here because I didn't frame this one well, but so, um, well, yes. Okay. So someone typed in medical malpractice. So justice and the idea of law, abortion is something absolutely that people feel very strongly about usually one way or another. Um, everyone should have access to healthcare, unequal access to healthcare, brilliantly put. And that's the idea. So this is, justice is actually a bedrock principle of medical ethics, interestingly. And so... Um, many people who work in the healthcare field feel that everyone, and, and this gets down to sort of a philosophical question, do you feel that healthcare is a right that everyone should have? And as I mentioned, constitutionally, the only group that actually has the right to healthcare in the United States are people who are incarcerated, oddly enough. That's the only group for whom it is enshrined in law that they have a right to healthcare. For the rest of us, it's kind of a privilege or a benefit, right? We talk about healthcare as a, as a workplace benefit. Um, and so uh, it, uh, it, it's, it's a very interesting question about distribution of resources. The other way that justice comes into it is when we talk about scarce resources. And the pandemic provides multiple examples of this. So when you think about, we don't in the United States like to talk about rationing care, but the pandemic presented probably the, the best example in our lifetimes thus far. When the early in the pandemic, we thought there was gonna be this crush of people going to the intensive care units needing mechanical ventilation in order to keep them alive, we simply didn't have enough mechanical ventilators or thought we didn't have enough. That was true in Oklahoma, it was true coast to coast. And so in the previous presidential administration, they, they uh, used the uh, Defense Powers Act to, to create uh, a, a huge number commandeer essentially the resources necessary to make new ventilators. Similarly, efforts have been put into scaling up vaccine production and vaccine distribution. So it's been a really interesting idea that we have. A great example too is the idea, uh, um, the, the medical technology of, of kidney dialysis. Now kidney dialysis was something that was developed in the late 50s and throughout the 1960s. And um, it wasn't until 19, I think 72, when Congress passed the End Stage Renal uh, Disease ESRD Act, which essentially anyone uh, who has end stage renal disease, that's another protected group, those folks are guaranteed the right to have dialysis because prior to that, what we had were hospital committees that would decide, well, who gets dialysis when we only have a few dialysis machines? And so this was the, a great example of a very scarce resource that could only be afforded to um, not all the folks who needed it. And so it was a scarce resource. And you, know, you can imagine what criteria might go into deciding who would get kidney dialysis. And so it, it became, uh, I think, sort of morally difficult to say, well, who are we to judge? Well, who should get dialysis? Not who are we to evaluate the worth of a human life? And so Congress actually passed a law that said anyone who meets these Bio, biological criteria to have that with a certain amount of kidney failure can get dialysis. And now the Medicare program essentially covers 
all folks for dialysis. Um, so those are your four principles. So I'll re repeat them. Autonomy, the ability to make decisions. Beneficence, which is trying to do good, trying to help people, trying to um, comfort them, trying to cure them. Non-maleficence, the trying to mitigate or lessen doing harm or do no harm. And then justice, the idea of being as fair as possible in the distribution of resources and trying to do things uh, to do things ethically and morally. Um, so I wanted to shift now and talk to you about um, areas, and I saw some uh, chats about this, in, in comments in the chat about where healthcare can go astray. And this is uh, particularly felt in the area of the expense of healthcare. So the United States spends, it's said, three and a half trillion dollars per year in all health in aggregate in healthcare goods and services. Now that's all the dollars put in for all of the technology, all of the hospital care, all of the, do the doctor's visits, the lab tests, the durable medical equipment, um, and also the, you know, honestly, the, the, the payment that goes to doctors and nurses and, uh, and uh, people who work in, in the healthcare field. Now what's interesting is because it's, it's, a, it's a skewed market, it's certainly a market, but it's skewed. So you don't have the opportunity typically as an employee or as an employer, a little bit more as an employer, you can decide maybe which company you want to contract with as far as who's going to administer benefits for your employees. But you don't really have much say over the cost of, of, of care that's going to be provided. So um, for example, let's give the, the sort of uh, obvious example, which is heaven forbid, you have an emergency, you think you're having a heart attack, and you call 911, and an ambulance comes and takes you to the nearest hospital. And that's, that's a really great societal good that our system has created and put together. But there's sort of this idea that we're insured in a network, and we want to go to a hospital in our network. And there are just dozens, if not thousands of stories of people who have gone and gotten medical treatment under duress in an acute emergent situation who've had their lives saved through great medical intervention only to find at the end of it a five or six figure uh, hospital bill. And the, and the reason being that they were out of network or one, one group of the, of the doctors involved, whether it was the anesthesiologist or the surgeons or the cardiac interventionalists, um, somehow weren't in the network. And so therefore the care wasn't pre-approved. And what seems ludicrous on its face is this idea that you're suffering acutely, you're in an ambulance, you're not gonna exactly be calling around trying to find like the bargain shop for the best price on your cardiac care. Now that's an extreme example, but it, in, the, in the less extreme examples, it's, it's, the same, it's almost the same way. So I've, if you follow this stuff in the news media like I do, you'll find that you know, even getting a COVID test, which was supposed to be sort of a covered benefit, people have been smacked with huge bills for getting COVID testing, depending on which point of care they've gone to, whether it's been to an emergency room, an urgent care center, their doctor's office, or the, like the public health department. So all of those things can lead. And why is it that the same test given at a different venue could cost drastically different? And another, perhaps the most prosaic example of all, many of us take a medication, right? We might take certain medications every day, whether it's for cholesterol or our blood pressure or our thyroid. These are medicines we need to essentially function normally or to lower our risk of having a, a cardiac event down the road. Or heaven forbid you have cancer and you're getting a chemotherapy drug. These drugs are exorbitantly expensive. Now, why is it that a blood pressure medicine that's labeled by one name, it's generic name, can be bought at a, uh, a local pharmacy for $4 for month supply or $10 for 90 day supply? Or if you get a brand name version of the medication, it can cost you know tens or hundreds of dollars more. There's just no rational system for this. And it's, it's almost impossible to know. You can be a very savvy consumer. So this is an example of where the business ethics of healthcare, I think, go very far astray. And then another one is, is just fairness. And there's been some recent, there was a really good recent investigative series um, that was done between two organizations. One is called Kaiser Health News, which is a nonprofit uh, health source that covers healthcare industry in the New York Times, which is a you know, basically at this point, a national newspaper. But they looked at um, what happens in automobile accidents. And what they found is that when people are brought to a hospital after an automobile accident, and you can think about what a vulnerable state you would be in, not-for-profit hospitals often encourage 
those victims of automobile accidents not to use, not to register with their health insurance, but instead they say, don't, don't, um, don't use your insurance information because it's whoever was responsible for the accident, their insurance company is going to wind up paying for it. But what winds up happening down the road is the, the patients wind up paying these a la carte prices instead of these negotiated rates, they wind up paying these exorbitant costs for any medical treatment that they receive. And these turns out to be these huge profit centers for hospitals, especially nonprofit hospitals, which we think of as providing community benefit. And so I think that this expose, and this was just in the last month, this expose is going to lead to real reform um, in some of the business practices uh, of, of uh, hospitals and, and healthcare organizations. Um, but I could go on with that for, for a lengthy bit of time. But when you, when you um, think of, um, yeah, oh, and somebody said very hard for seniors to navigate, and that is very true. If you're, a, if you're a senior for 65 or older and you're eligible for Medicare, you're bombarded almost on a daily basis with opportunities to have many, many different insurance products. There's straight fee-for-service Medicare. There's, there's what's called gap insurance to cover the 20% that Medicare doesn't cover for outpatient services for secondary policies. Then there are these so-called Medicare Advantage plans, which are managed care plans for Medicare that almost every insurance company offers. And there's so many of them. And they're very appealing because they offer usually $0 copays and, uh, and uh, all kinds of screening tests or hearing aids or glasses covered under the plan. But oftentimes they, they have a very narrow network. So you have to stay in the network that's provided, which if you can, that's great. But sometimes if people go outside of the network, they wind up with a huge bill. And so... Um, that's the thing. And so somebody did ask, um, yeah, a good Q&A question is whether or not uh, healthcare should be a profit-driven business. And I, I wonder that a lot of times myself. You know, the main answer to that is that a lot of people say if, if we don't let healthcare continue to be a for-profit business on some level, we'll lose the innovation and research that goes on that makes like U.S. healthcare, um, you know, considered often the best in the world. So, but, you know, I, I still, I leave it to you. I, I think that, um, you know, healthcare in, in many ways should be, should not have a profit motive in it because we see all kinds of examples of where the profit motive skews the incentives away from the primary goal, which is providing care. So let's compare that now to business ethics, right? And so you have a group of stakeholders, you have your customers and your clients. Well, you know, in, in healthcare, we typically call those folks patients. Some people like to steer away from the word patient, but most, I think, medical ethics folks and, and most people in healthcare still use that word. But sometimes people call people in health, patients in healthcare clients. Um, and I, I think that language, some people don't like the, the, that use because they think it does bring in kind of the business vocabulary to healthcare and that that's uh, an unfortunate thing. But your other stakeholders, of course, are your employees. And so this brings up a whole set of ethics is you have a duty to your employees, both to you know, provide a safe workplace, um, to provide, you know, essentially the, the your contractual obligation, which you've pr promised them in terms of a wage and benefits, and um, you know the employee side of that contract is that they're going to, you know, show up for work and do a good job and be evaluated and and on, on some kind of periodic basis. And if they do the job, great, they might be eligible for a promotion or a bonus. And if you know if they don't do their job well, they may they may wind up losing their employment. But uh, the other question is. How much control do you have over employees? Well, you have a code of conduct, and you have a uh, you have a set of rules for the for the job in the workplace. There are external rules, of course. There are federal rules and state rules around workplace and workplace safety. Um, but then there are sort of the internal rules of your company and how how your employees operate. And so, what kind of what kind of power or pressure can you bring to bear on your em employees when something happens, like a public health challenge, like COVID? Well, certainly you can you can make a corporate policy to have your employees wear masks if they need be, and and I'll ask this question in a in a slide or two. But what about the vaccine when it becomes more widely available? Can you obligate your can you mandate that your employees take the coronavirus vaccine? You know, what if people have a very uh, you know a, a serious allergy to to other vaccines or in the past, or what if they you know are a vaccine? What we call vaccine hesitant is the term of art nowadays. That is, they're sort of frightened by vaccines or they've read a lot of stuff about vaccines. I just want to be very clear. I'm a huge proponent. I'm a huge supporter of vaccine. As I mentioned, I've had both of the um, Moderna uh, vaccines myself. I've had every vaccine that uh, I could have with the exception thus far of the shingles vaccine. I am old enough and I will get it soon. <laughs> um, but I do think that vaccines have had a huge role in public health and in uh, in terms of our overall wellness. And I want to be very clear about that. I'm not I'm not 
I don't want to cast any doubt on their safety or efficacy. That is not to say that sometimes there are mishaps that occur with vaccines. That, that does happen. Um, and then you have other stakeholders too, which are your boards, whether you're a, a for-profit company, there's a, there's a board, or even nonprofits, of course, have their own boards. And, and then even the, the back in the uh, public companies have uh, stockholders. So you have many different stakeholders that you're um, that, that you work with, that you have different audiences and stakeholders for whom you must message, for whom you must uh, try to achieve some sort of consistency and for whom you must try to um, no doubt toe the ethical line in, in, your, in your business. Um, so COVID really, as I've alluded to a number of times, it just gives us almost endless number of ethical considerations. So the, the probably the top line one is this whole idea of public health versus private rights. And we've seen this play out certainly in Oklahoma, but you know, all over the country. So when we think about the public health, we've had the, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, we've had the White House, we've had the National Institutes of Health. So many of these august institutions give us guidelines, guidance and recommendations for what we can do to best protect ourselves, our families and our neighbors from the contagion of the novel coronavirus or SARS-CoV-2 as it's known. Um, and that always comes into conflict with our private rights, right? As citizens, as employees, and you know, there's no greater example than, than mask wearing. So you know, many jurisdictions, so I live in Tulsa where I am right now. And I know many of you are in Tulsa, many of you are in Oklahoma City. Tulsa has a mask mandate. And so it's been extended through April 30th. And so you're expected to wear a mask in public and to any business that you go into, you're expected to wear a mask. Now at the state level, our governor has, has uh, chosen not to, uh, has essentially stated that it's not enforceable to, uh, to implement a mask mandate and, and wants to leave it up to individual communities. But that's a great example. We've seen people get very angry and irate about being forced to wear masks. They've been asked to leave establishments. If you're not wearing a mask, you know, please leave. And it's, people feel it's an affront to their personal liberty. And that's, that's very understandable. And then the analogy will often come up about seatbelts. Well, do you feel like wearing a seatbelt? You know, seatbelt is for your safety. Um, and we, you know, when those first came in, they weren't, even, they weren't even put in cars, let alone mandated. And over time, we gradually came to accept the use of seatbelts to where it's now law that you're required as a driver or a passenger in a, in a motor vehicle that you're required to wear a seatbelt. So that if you're pulled over for another violation and not wearing a seatbelt, you can be ticketed for that, cited for that as well. But that's, that's a paradigmatic example of public health versus private rights, and that's at the big level. But we already talked a little bit about the just distribution of resources. So we talked about ventilators. Um, you know, even early on in the pandemic, masks, just, just getting a mask. So you, let's say you wanted to wear a mask. You had trouble finding one. PPE, that's personal protective equipment. These are gowns and gloves and the things that healthcare workers wear. These were really hard to come by. And what wound up happening was that hospitals were negotiating against each other. States were negotiating against other states. Um, we had a very disorganized response to the pandemic early on because I think we were a little bit caught unawares and didn't know how serious this was going to be. Um, and so we wound up having a scarcity of PPE and of masks, but um, certainly other medicines come in, come to the fore too. Um, you know, we, we've, we've come up against shortages of medicines, uh, particularly even prednisone uh, or methylprednisolone, the uh, intravenous steroid that's given for lots of conditions, but also in the case of COVID-19. And then vaccine stories. I don't have to tell you if you've been following the news at all that um, you know it, it is nothing short of an actual miracle that these new vaccines were developed so quickly. Um, I have to say I was pretty pessimistic because knowing how long it takes to develop vaccines, I thought it would be at least a couple of years. And what wound up happening was these the, the two vaccines that are uh, under an emergency use authorization uh, licensed for use in the United States right now, the Moderna and the Pfizer, both of those are what are called mRNA vaccines. And I don't have a slide on this, but it stands for messenger RNA. And it's a totally new vaccine mechanism. Um, heretofore, we did vaccines a kind of a couple of ways. One was we either took what's called an attenuated virus. So that is a virus that was zapped so it couldn't harm you and cause the disease, but the particle itself could go in your body and get your immune system primed to fight it. So you'd essentially be protected from that disease. The other way is we take proteins from the, from the shell of the bacteria or the shell of a virus. And that similarly would inspire your immune system to develop both antibody and what's called cellular, cellular immunity to those pathogens. But what's different here is 
they take the messenger RNA from the, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus and they put it in this little uh, lipid nanoparticle, it's called, and that's what they give you. And what's interesting is the vaccine, and it, I admit it, just, it sounds frightening. It's different than the vaccines we're used to. It goes in and it actually intercalates the mRNA into your cells and the cells then start producing the protein that creates the immune response. And luckily for us, there were research groups that had already been looking at this technology. And once we were able to decode the genetic sequence for the SARS-CoV-2, they were able to kind of almost plug in this new technology into this, and it became a great case example. But when the first studies came out and said that the Pfizer and the Moderna were 94, 95% effective, I mean, this was mind blowing to me. This was absolutely incredible. Um, and so, Yes, now we've gotten the, the production of these vaccines ramped up and they're, they're widely available, although not as available as we'd like. It's amazing <laughs> how, um, <laughs> I don't know, I think of us as a society, we're so jaded that we, it's like this miracle of these things existed. And now we're all kind of moaning about like, ah, I can't get a vaccine. And, and listen, I have elderly parents. My dad is spending time in Florida in the winter and he's 83 years old and he's been incredibly frustrated at his inability to get registered online you know, this is an example somebody alluded to earlier is a senior citizen who's having trouble and I had to try to go online for him and he wound up having to go to the grocery store where, you know, every state has a little bit of a different uh, relationship with pharmacies or grocery stores or how they want to distribute the vaccines. Well, so scarcity, this is a great example of scarcity uh, and a great example of too of information and misinformation, you know, vaccines are, are probably at the center of one of the great debates in healthcare. Um, again, I want to as a medical professional issue, my strong support and strong belief in the safety of vaccines and their efficacy. Um, and then we talked a little bit about, you know, uh, employers' rights. And that is, you know, what is the employee's right? Well, right now, as I understand it, and you guys can educate me, but I understand that the law says that when a vaccine is licensed under an EUA, an emergency use authorization, that you can't mandate it for um, like school children, for example, but once it has full FDA approval, it is then allowable under the law for a state uh, or an entity to then require it of say entering students. Similarly for a workplace, you could see under the current EUA, I don't believe you can do that. Now you could strongly encourage your employees and that's where I get into this question of incentivizing. And I have read about some employers offering a cash assistance or cash basis uh, a cash incentive, if you will, to for employees to say, hey, go ahead and please get your vaccine. Um, so I would, I'd be very interested to hear your questions or your thoughts about that. Um, I have one last example. This is literally from today's newspaper or yesterday's uh, online newspaper. This is Dr. Hassan Gokal. He was fired. He took a job uh, with the, uh, in the Houston, greater Houston area. He volunteered and took, he left his emergency room job and he was so, his wife has an autoimmune condition. So he was so frightened of bringing COVID home to his wife that he left his emergency room job and volunteered with the public health uh, entity there. And I don't know if it was the county or in Houston. So he wound up being in a vaccine, becoming a vaccine administrator. Well, he opened up a vial of vaccine and there's 10 doses. And I can't remember if it was the COVID or the Moderna. The bottom line is he had a, an open vial of vaccine and he really didn't want to waste it. So he basically found some people that were candidates and he even asked his supervisor, can I give this vaccine? I don't want it to go to waste. And the answer he got back was yes, absolutely. Don't let it go to waste. Well, it wound up kind of coming back around and he got fired for violating kind of protocol. And he's not, it's, it's, some people are saying, well, he, you know, he gave one to his wife and that's really one of the ethical questions. Now his wife met the criteria, but it seemed kind of, uh, murky to say the least for this physician to inoculate his own wife. Um, but he got fired from the job. And then what happened is I think the district attorney brought charges against him. But then interestingly, the judge, I think, dismissed the case by saying that, that the DA had no right to question this medical professional's integrity. And now he's become a little bit of a cause celeb, meaning that he, um, people are saying, hey, he did the right thing by not, by not letting this, this precious resource, this vaccine go to waste. And he, he did the best that he could under difficult circumstances. It's just another example of ethics playing out right here in the news media. So with that, I wanna conclude because I could talk as you probably can guess endlessly. I, I shared with you some of the core principles of medical ethics, those big four autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence and justice. We talked a little bit about that intersection between medical ethics and business ethics. And of course, some of the 
practices in, in medicine and in healthcare that I find troubling that I'm sure you do too, as I could tell from the chat. Um, and then we talk very briefly about some ethical considerations vis-a-vis -vis the COVID-19 pandemic. And I would now be happy to uh, take questions, but I thank you so much for your engagement. I mean, boy, the, uh, Bailey had warned me, but I, she was right. The chat it really came firing through. Uh, you guys are great, great, great audience. So thank you so much. Yes, um, I, yeah, we do have a really chatty group and I love that people are so enthusiastic and ready to um, participate. So thank you all for your great questions. So um, I will remind you before we do Q&A, please, if you are getting a CPE, go ahead. And if you're not asking a question, just share some thoughts in the chat or write your name in the chat so that we know who you are. But we have had so many questions come in just over the course of the program, as you probably saw Dr. Schumann, which this has I been fascinating. <laughs> yeah, I know. I've, I've written them down. So okay, um, we can accept new um, new questions in the chat, but also you can use the Q&A um, the Q&A screen as well. So um, I will go ahead. There were a few that I thought were really um, were really interesting. Um, someone asked, does healthcare have any ethical responsibilities for um, equal pricing or can you know congruent pricing across um, across I, the platform? Yeah, the, it's a great question. I, I think there is an ethical imperative to do so, but there's no legal requirement. And I think that the marketplace and I think free, free marketers, free enterprise folks, and I would count myself in that as well. Um, unfortunately, I don't think we're going to see that anytime soon. Um, yeah, that's a great answer. Another one that's kind of on kind of the economics of it all again is um, someone asked, do you believe that high levels of student loan debt for medical students entering into the profession makes um, contributes to the need for higher profits in the healthcare industry? That's a great question. I think it does. Although I do think that it's linked, but it's indirect. But uh, here's an example. Um, the medical School tuition is very high, there's no doubt, but you know, it's, it's so is law school, so is, so are professional schools. So, I mean, let's be honest, so is college education. I mean, it's out of the reach of many, even in middle-class families without some um, financial assistance. Um, I think what the high cost, the, the high amount of medical school debt leads to is students choosing higher paying specialties and indirectly, then the higher paying specialties feed the beast. It feeds the kind of high profit cycles. I don't think necessarily the med school debt leads directly to the uh, high profit making in healthcare, but it's, it contributes to it. But the, I, think, I think the bottom line is, and we know this from data, is when we survey students on their residency choices, they most often say they'll go into the most highly remunerative specialties because of their level of debt. And what winds up happening is people who are who are smart and thoughtful wind up not going into say general internal medicine or general pediatrics. Or they avoid the primary care specialties because they're they're hard. You work hard and you you earn less. Although don't feel too sorry for doctors. I mean doctors are always going to earn a living, and even with that exorbitant debt, they are going to be able to pay their way out. I mean I think you know it's it's teachers and it's folks who are who don't you know doctors are rewarded by society. I mean I'm, I'm going to be very honest about that. But there, there is a there in that higher earning echelon, there is quite a range. But it's even the lowest paid doctor does very well by society standards. Yes, um, someone who just asked kind of a piggyback question to that. Can you take it one step further and talk about the parity in healthcare services offered um, to the associated costs? I don't know. Maybe I didn't word that well. Yeah, uh, I'm trying to. Understand. So w when I hear the word parity, what I think of, and I might not be answering the question that you're actually asking, um, people talk about parity laws with regard to healthcare and mental health. And for a long time, we've stigmatized mental health and thought of it as other, as different. Um, and you know, one of the goals of the mental health community is to try to say, hey, we've got to treat mental health the same way we treat, if you want to call it physical health or body health. That is, if someone has a knee operation or a, a lung operation, or they have a, um, you know, we, we get it. We understand that that worker might be disabled, but if someone has a mental health thing, we think of them as defective or weak or something like that, or, or um, it's a character flaw as opposed to a true illness. 
So that's one way in which parity, and there are, there are laws on the books now about mental health parity and treating and providing the same levels of insurance coverage, because typically mental health has been carved out from many insurance coverage policies into a separate place or less reimbursed. And so I know men, many mental health advocacy groups, and I think of in Tulsa, there's a thing called the, a nonprofit, the Healthy Minds Initiative. They're working very hard on this issue of parity. And I think it's one that I, I wholeheartedly support. Great. Um, I want to ask this question because I think we saw this a lot during the pandemic. How do you balance the safety of healthcare workers and patients with the safety of patients who need care? Or, you know, when there's a high risk, I guess, to the healthcare workers. Yeah. So, you know, it's like, um, I, the people always use this, this analogy, which is when you're on the airplane and the, uh, I mean, luckily this very rarely happens. When the oxygen mask comes down, they say, put on your own oxygen mask first, even before you help the, the children. I remember being on an airplane, my kids going like, yuck, you're, you're going to do yourself first. The, the analogy holds up because in healthcare, you've got to take care of yourself first, because if you get sick or you go down or you're vulnerable, you're not going to be able to care for those patients. And so it is vitally important that, you know, we provide our, our frontline healthcare workers with the right personal protective equipment um, in order to be able to do the jobs that they're there to do. And, um, you know, healthcare, there is a little bit of a cowboy mentality still with amongst healthcare workers um, who will say, hey, I'm ready to roll up my sleeves and get in there and, and uh, you know, do it no matter what. But, you know, we've, we see people get harmed. We see people get needle stick injuries. We see people, you know, slip and fall. We see people get infected from, you know, what the work they do in the hospital. And there, was, there are many examples. Many, many healthcare workers have gotten sick with COVID or died uh, from COVID. And so that's been a terrible, you know, added to the compounded the tragedy uh, here, well, across the world, but in the United States. Yeah, well, thank you so much. I see that we have one minute left. So I, um, I want to thank you so much for your time. I know that we are going to, um, we're going to end right here. I don't know if Dr. Schumann, you want to stick around for a minute for those who are able to, to answer more questions or um, we I can, can, yes, I can, I can wait. Sure. Okay. I wanted to go ahead and I know a lot of people have back-to-back -back <laughs> meetings on Zoom, especially we can click right from one meeting to another. So um, I wanted to go ahead and dismiss those who um, need to leave, but yes, Dr. Schumann, if you're willing to answer just a couple more questions, we could hang out for just a few more minutes. Um, yeah. But yeah, this has been incredibly fascinating. And I think that it's very evident through the number of questions that we've gotten. I know that you touched on this, but before everyone signs off, I wanted to go ahead and reiterate this because I know this is a concern for so many of our members as we're all looking how to navigate, you know, moving forward. But is it legal for a company to require employees to be vaccinated? As you may educate me on this, because but as I understand it, it is not uh well sorry legal do you ask the question so is it ethical it could be ethical <laughs> is it legal at this point you cannot my understanding is under the emergency use authorization you cannot mandate it now if the fda does a wide approval of any of the coronavirus vaccines whether it's the moderna the pfizer the johnson and johnson the astrazeneca any of the ones um then it's a question of is it legal you know many workplaces so you know, I'm, I have, I don't, I work for OU, but I also have privileges at a hospital in Tulsa and they, that's perfectly within their rights to say as a condition of being on the medical staff or an employee, you have to do this. Now that's, and that's not challengeable really because they're a healthcare enterprise. I think the courts understand that and the law. Um, I'm not a legal expert, so don't take, don't take this to the bank, but you might, you'll definitely want to check with your uh, lawyers. But if, if it becomes FDA approved, and, uh, you know, depending on the nature of the work you do, I, I mean, even even just, you know, garden variety office work, I think given the fact that it's a pandemic, this is an example of where the public health can outweigh the individual liberty. I think it is going to, you're going to see this come up. Let's just put it that way. And the answer is, I think that certain employers will be able to mandate it. And I think others may get exemptions or, or certain employees might be able to get exemptions from it. So that's a, my way of straddling and saying, I don't really know. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that's, I mean, I think that we're all, yeah, this is uncharted waters for everyone. So yeah. thank you for providing your insight there. It's very interesting. Um, we've had so many questions about, you know, especially as you were talking about the justice of, you know, you know, what does accessibility to healthcare look like? Um, 
someone asked, would a system like the UK's NHS work here in the US? Well, that's a great question. And it's one I've thought a lot about. And um, I'll give you, I mean, the, the, simple, the simple answer is it's complicated. And um, there are many people who don't like that idea, but there are many that do. I mean, I guess if you, and again, I'm, I'm only saying this as a point of information, not in any kind of political advocacy way, but like Bernie Sanders, right? He was running for president. He is a, um, he's a self-described democratic socialist from the state of Vermont. He's, he's an, actually an independent senator, but he caucuses with Democrats. Bernie Sanders favors a national health system much on the UK model. So Canada has, a, they call it the same thing we call here Medicare, but in Canada, everyone who's a Canadian citizen is covered and has government. So there's one payer in Canada, single payer is the, is the Canadian Medicare. But the, the doctors and the hospitals still exist on their own. It's just that the insurance comes from the government. The UK, they have the NHS, the National Health Service, where everything is essentially owned by the government. So the facilities, the hospitals and the clinics are owned by the National Health Service and the, the, most of the physicians are then employed by it. So they really have total control and that way they can control costs. So their costs are much lower. Obviously the disincentive is if you, if you wanna you know, be a, a doctor or a healthcare worker, uh, not only do you have to achieve academically, you think, oh, I'm going to go into this field and just be like a government worker. That's not a great incentive or a really alluring thing. In Canada, it's a little different. They can they can charge what they want, but they're only going to get paid that Medicare set price. Um, but I, you know, could it work? Definitely, it could work. Um, would it work in America? I mean, many many people much smarter than me, many pundits think it'd never work in America. There's just way too much opposition to it, and it would be too complex. You have so many, um, you have an existing system with so many players in it. And if you went to some kind of nationalized health system, it would be definitely simpler. It would definitely cost less. I mean, that's there's no doubt about that. I don't think even people who are viciously opposed to it would disagree with that. But those that are opposed to it would say it would stifle innovation and it would wipe out a huge swath of the economy, which is all those insurance companies and all their employees and, you know, and that's not, I mean, even Elizabeth Rosenthal, who's the editorial chief of Kaiser Health News, this nonprofit health news source that I highly respect, she said, hey, we always talk about national health insurance like it's no big deal, but she's like, we would lose probably 2 million jobs. I mean, that's a, that's a serious blow to the economy. So I don't, I mean, I think it could work, and I would even volunteer to work in a system like that, but I also think, you know, we have micro examples of that. The Veterans Administration is, is all just government controlled. The Indian Health Service, to a large extent, is, is uh, federally controlled. And those are good examples. There's lots of gems in both of those systems, but then there's lots of discontent from the consumers on both sides that they're too piecemeal, too far apart, um, don't you know, don't provide enough in the way of customer service. But they're they're good examples. A lot of I mean, a lot of people tout the VA for its high quality. Yeah, well, that's yeah, really really interesting perspective. Um, we had when you were talking about mRNA um, in the vaccine. Um, we had a question about that the Johnson and Johnson vaccine, as we understand it, um, it is more DNA specific than mRNA. What what's the difference there? Well, so DNA um, lives in the nucleus of the cell, and messenger RNA is is what's produced by the by the DNA replication, and then the mRNA molecule goes out from the nucleus of the cell into the what's called the cytosol, and where it adheres to the ribosome to make proteins. To, it, it's essentially what tells the cellular machinery to make proteins. Um, the difference is not much. The difference between the molecules, DNA is a double-stranded helix, and mRNA is usually single-stranded, and then they use different, uh, what are called, chemically, they use different bases. Um, I think there's like a a thymine versus a uracil or something like that, a T versus a U. It's, it's just like small chemical differences. Um, I think functionally, it, the biggest difference in the Johnson Johnson vaccine, as I understand it, is it's one inoculation rather than the two. And they seem to get a pretty good, a pretty robust uh, immune response. Okay, interesting. Um, and I think this is a good one to... Um, I think this is a good one to end on because I know we've gone a few minutes over here um, and I wanna be respectful of your time too, Dr. Schumann, but um, what would you specifically say to people or you know, even medical professionals who are reluctant to take the vaccine? Take it, that's what <laughs> I say. Um, it's, I mean, if we're, I guess, for, I, like many of us, I'm, steeped in in pandemic stuff and i definitely have pandemic fatigue as well 
Um, but it's, it's an incredible time we're living through. I would say it, it, for us to get out of this, we got to get herd immunity. And the fastest way to get herd immunity is for people to willingly accept the vaccine. And I saw, like I was lo looking at the chat, it was going too fast, but um, I would just tell you that even whether it's an mRNA vaccine or a DNA vaccine, it cannot, yes, it's going to go into your body and yes, it's going to create the immune response. It will not change your body's DNA or your body's mRNA. That is not possible. It's not going to, it's not going to genetically alter you in any way. Um, and no, nor will it, you know, be carried through generations. This, this is really just think of it as a, I like in the, in the UK and the Commonwealth country, they call it a jab, the flu, like they flu jab or the COVID, the COVID jab, get the jab. The worst part about it is honestly, it hurts a little bit in the muscle, um, maybe more so than your annual flu shot. Um, but I don't know, I feel invincible now. Like I want to go out there and take my mask off, but I, I won't yet. But, um, you know, for, for those around me, but I do feel like I am much less susceptible. I mean, that's just a psychological, obviously, but, um, I, I mean, I understand vaccine hesitancy. I really do. And I, but I just think, especially if you work in healthcare, I think it's incumbent on you. You, you have a responsibility because as, as much as we think about it for ourselves, we're doing it for, for our other people. It's for our patients and our loved ones. We, by vaccinating ourselves, we're, we lessen the likelihood of becoming vectors of contagion ourselves. Yeah. So we might not get sick, but we, we lessen the likelihood we'll spread it. And that's the thing is about COVID has been so devastating is asymptomatic spread, right? So you don't get sick, but you're spreading it without even knowing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what's been, uh, yeah, that's what's been so, I think, making all of us be so much more cautious, I think, because, you know, we don't know if we have it as we're walking around. So that's been definitely a um, major concern for all of us, I believe. But, um, you know, we've gone about 10 minutes over and we still had more questions coming through the chat, but I just, um, you know, I want to acknowledge those, but I just want to thank you, Dr. Schumann, for sharing all of this incredible insight with us. I feel like um, I have a better understanding of um, of medical ethics and also how we can use that um, and, you know, use that perspective as we think about making decisions in our own um, in our own workplaces. So thank you for sharing with us. I feel like this was a rapid fire Q&A session at the end. So thank you for um, for taking that in stride. But um, thank I was you. delighted to be here. Yeah, thank you for the invitation. I'd be happy to come back again. And, and um, it's a what a great audience. And it, I, I mean, that's the goal is always to stimulate some good conversation. So thank you. Thank you, everyone, for your attention. And thank you so much for uh, having me. Yes, absolutely. All right. Thank you all. Those of you who have asked in the chat, you know, we are recording this session. So it will be um, so it will be available here within the next week or so. We'll get that up as soon as we can because I know um, there was so much information. I believe I'm gonna have to rewatch to really be able to absorb it all. But um, thank you all for joining us today. We appreciate you um, and appreciate your membership and your support of OK Ethics and also your desire to learn more. So Thank you again, and we will um, see you all soon. And thank you, Brianne. I see you're still on here. Thank you for, for sharing with us.